Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is Franz Hartman. I'm the coordinator of the Alliance for Livable Ontario. Uh, for those of you who are new to Livable Ontario, we're an alliance of people and groups representing hundreds of thousands of Ontarians from many different sectors. Uh, we want to build a livable Ontario and stop the provincial government policies that falsely claim they will solve the housing challenges facing us while harming our communities and undermining the protection of our farmland, natural areas, and democratic institutions. First, let me begin with a land acknowledgement. The Alliance for Livable Ontario recognizes that its work and the work of its members take place on traditional Indigenous territories across the province. We acknowledge that there are 46 treaties and other agreements that cover the territory now called Ontario. We are thankful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to contribute to the strength of Ontario and to all communities across the province. ALO is honored to collaborate with Indigenous colleagues, rights holders and communities. Acknowledging traditional Indigenous territories is one way to recognize contemporary and historical Indigenous presence and land rights. It is a small step towards dismantling the continued, impact, Im, continued impacts of colonialism and undoing Indigenous erasure in our everyday lives. Before we get to the main event, I want to let, you, let everyone know that our new website is now live. Uh, one of the key features allows all of us to exchange resources and post information on upcoming events. So if you haven't already done so, please spend a minute uh, taking a tour of the new website. Um, and don't forget to submit any events and resources you think other Alliance members might be interested in. Okay, now to the main event. This is the first webinar in the Building Hope series. Uh, we created this series because many of us feel hopeless given what's going on and happening at uh, Queen's Park. Uh, think of the housing file, for example. Housing has become a big issue in pretty well every corner in the province. I suspect almost everyone here knows someone who can't find a home with an affordable rent in a neighborhood they wanna live in, or someone who is having financial problems buying their first home, or someone who is experiencing real difficulty just paying their rent. Bottom line, there are real housing challenges facing us. The response by the provincial government has been extremely worrying. Uh, they've introduced and adopted legislation and regulations that fundamentally weaken planning and environmental laws and open up the green belt uh, in natural areas and farmland to development. In short, they've turbocharged urban sprawl. And there seems to be mounting evidence from across many sectors that these actions will not only harm the environment and farmers and natural areas, it will do little to solve the housing challenges we face, especially for those most in need. So it's understandable many people feel hopeless and sad. But the great news is that the solutions we need to build a livable Ontario, especially to deal with the housing challenges we face, are all around us. They exist in communities across Ontario, as well as in other parts of Canada and the world. They are doable, they're real, practical, and affordable, which is why we created the Building Hope webinar series. We wanna give you hope and inspiration to build a livable Ontario. We wanna connect you with others uh, uh, who, who, who are interested in this. We wanna give you accessible information and tools about issues and solutions that are relevant to your daily life. So the first set of webinars are all about housing. Today, we start unpacking the housing challenges we face and begin looking at real solutions. Our focus over the next hour is finding out where the land is we need for housing and what type of housing we need. And in a moment, uh, we're going to hear from two experts who will give us some great bite-sized insights into the causes of and the solutions to the housing challenges facing us. Then we're gonna have a Q&A and after that, probably around five-ish or so, we're going to have an after event uh, where we will continue the discussion and invite those of you who stay to ask more questions and make comments. But first, let's get a bit of information from you via two Zoom polls. I want to introduce Ian Borsick, the Acting Executive Director of Environment Hamilton, and our wonderful Zoom master who will walk us through the polls. Ian. Thank you, Franz. So I'm going to be putting up a poll on the screen for everyone. There's two questions. Um, I will end the poll once we have a decent group of you who have responded. So the poll is now launched and I 
Just need folks to fill that out. I'm pretty sure no one can see the live results like I do, but uh, it very interesting to see uh, the answers to these first two questions rolling in. Uh, we're just at about 50% of you have filled it out, so we'll just wait a little bit longer. So if you're taking your time and to really think about this, you can take a little bit longer, but I'll be ending the poll once we reach uh, as close to 90% as we can. Alrighty, the poll's been up for a little bit. I, uh, I'll give everyone, you know, maybe 10 to 15 more seconds to submit your answers before I finish the poll and share the results with everyone. We're at 82% uh, participation, so I think that should be pretty representative of everyone who's on the call right now. Um, and I'll be ending the poll now. Uh, apologies if you are trying to get your results in there. So uh, for the first question, what do you think is the single biggest cause of the housing challenges facing us? 1% uh, uh, said government red tape, 0% said not enough land, and then we had 16% for bad planning policies, 33 for land speculators slash developers, and then 49% uh, lack of government investment in affordable housing. For the second question, um, and this was the hypothetical, think of a friend or neighbor, how would they answer the question? Um, and it seems to be pretty well, even across the board with uh, 20 at 28% uh, land speculators slash developers being the higher one. So thank you everyone for filling that out. Thank you, Ian, um, and thanks to all of you for answering your question or answering the, the questions. Now, let's uh, see what the experts have to say. So to guide this conversation, please welcome our moderator, Margaret Prophet, who's the executive director of the Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition. Margaret. Hi, thanks, Bronze. I, I'm not included in the experts, but I get to chat with them for a little bit. So I, I'm, I'm adjacent to the experts today. Um, it, as Fran said, we're talking about building hope and housing. And for those of you that follow housing policy, sometimes it doesn't feel overly helpful. And just to kind of um, kind of orient our conversation, I'll share one of my favorite quotes from Desmond uh, Tutu, who said, to choose hope is to step firmly forward into the howling wind, bearing one's chest to the elements, knowing that in time, the storm will pass. And I think that if we collect people like yourselves, um, together and talk about how we can make it different. Uh, it means we have to bear our chest to the wind a little bit. So I'm not going to say this is going to start off very hopeful because we have to dissect the conversation. But I do think that there's enough leadership around the province and in this particular webinar that we can um, make it better once the storm is over. Um, so I, without further ado, I'll get to the experts and I'll stop blabbing on here. We'll start with Sharice Berta, who is the executive, executive director of City Building TMU. She leads collaboration research in city building, urban innovation and policy research on issues of sustainable regional planning and development, housing affordability, placemaking and transportation. For over 25 years, she has been a thought leader who has influenced government policy in Ontario and BC. Welcome Sharice. Uh, next, we have Kevin Eby, who is a registered professional planner. He served as the Director of Community Planning with the Regional Municipality of Waterloo from 1999 to 2015, and has extensive experience dealing with and developing and implementing the province's growth plan. He also sat in the province's Greenbelt Council from 2018 to 2020. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, just as a reminder to all of our attendees, please put in your questions into the Q&A as you hear some uh, some really great info. And if you want to continue the conversation with attendees, please do so in the chat. Okay, so let's let's dissect this a little bit. Um, I, it seems based on the, the participants list, we have quite a few people uh, here who are very involved in this and probably know this as well as everybody else. But for those that aren't as, aren't as initiated in it, let's, let's dissect it a little bit. 
I think what I'm starting to hear, whether it be in policy documents or mostly in the press, press, you know, gatherings or in op-eds, seems to be very focused on the discussion about the housing crisis and boil down to basically two things. It's either about land supply or it's about red tape or a combination of the two of them. When we think of the housing crisis focused solely on those two causes, um, what are the implications for how we address the housing crisis when we're focused on these two causes? And I'll start with you, Sharice, and then I'll turn to you, Kevin, if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah, hi, thanks so much for having me. And Margaret, you're totally an expert. And I think we probably have a bunch of participants who are experts as well. Um, so I'll just start off by saying, yeah, I mean, that's the challenge that we're facing is that we're dealing with policymaking that has essentially hijacked um, the housing crisis and hi hijacked the housing affordability crisis and has kind of um, turned it into a land crisis or a red tape crisis. And the problem is that it depends on what crisis we're trying to solve. And if it's actually truly a housing affordability crisis, opening up um, land in the green belt will do nothing to address, say, the shortage of affordable rental in our communities. And even Ontario's own housing affordability task force stated that land wasn't a, an issue, right? They qualified it and said it's actually a housing supply problem, but we need to qualify that even further to address the type of housing supply we need to build. So more expensive houses built on farmland requiring long commutes likely isn't the type of supply that we need to address our crisis. And we can talk more about that later, but I think that this, this simplification into we, we just need um, more land. And, you know, Kevin is going to probably go into detail and talk about um, all the land that's already available. And I can add to that um, because I've been doing some analysis of land available in our urban and suburban boundaries. And it's like, we don't even need to sprawl. Like we've got enough land for intensification and it doesn't need building tall condos. It, you know, we can build family friendly homes in our existing urban areas, in our existing suburbs. So it really, um, so, so the challenge is that the, the red tape also is being used to make it easier to build any housing everywhere, anything at all costs. And so we've lost our guardrails to, to build the housing that we need and to build um, thoughtful supply, the supply that's actually gonna solve our crisis. You're on mute, Margaret. <laughs> See, again, rookie mistake. I was going to say thank you, Sharice. And what I was trying to say to myself, obviously, was um, that I saw on Twitter, someone put the provincial government has a 3A policy, build anything, anywhere, at any cost. <laughs> And I thought that's a pretty good thing. Uh, Kevin, what would you like to add to this uh, discussion? Yeah, uh, Ian, if you can put up my first slide, um, I, I'm going to just kind of walk you through uh, with some of the information on housing supply. I recognize from the first poll, I'm preaching to the converted uh, uh, because nobody seems to feel it is uh, a major cause. But let me just give you the facts. So. You know, as Cherie said, the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force in February 2022 said there, there isn't a shortage of land that's causing the problem. Next slide. The, uh, I did a review of the most recent uh, uh, municipal land needs assessments prepared in the Greater Golden Horseshoe as part of the municipal comprehensive review processes. Uh, this came out in February of 2023. And before any of the recent, the most recent urban expansions, there was over 2 million units of unbuilt housing capacity available in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Next slide. And, and you don't need to read this slide, but it's distributed relatively evenly. Nobody 
is short of land to meet the 2031 housing numbers. In fact, very few municipalities are significantly short of land before any expansions to meet the 2051 numbers. Next slide. And if just uh, this week, the City of Toronto land needs assessment has come out and it's identified a potential net new housing supply of almost 650,000 units by 2031 in Toronto and a total potential housing supply of 1.3 million units, which according to the staff report would actually take them into the next century. So plenty of supply available in municipalities. Next slide. The, the fourth report is the one by the Regional Planning Commissioners of Ontario. It came out in March, 2023, and they surveyed 15 municipalities representing 70% of Ontario's population and found there was over 1.5 million units already under construction or subject to approved applications or applications under review. Now you can't have an application without land to put it on. So this is a pretty clear indication, not only is there enough land, but there's enough uh, you know, development moving through the process to, to, to meet the requirements of the province for the 1.5 million by 2031. If you go to the next slide, please, Ian. Uh, the studies done by the province demonstrating the need for additional land, I haven't seen one yet. I haven't seen any from the province at all that deals specifically with the need for additional land to 2031. Next slide. And a lot of people think of, of the, the process for housing as a pipeline. You put land in one end, housing comes out the other. And, and in theory, this works when the diameter of the pipe remains constant, there's no obstructions. Next slide, Ian. But the reality is there are all kinds of obstructions in the process. Everything from the need for municipalities to do community planning and, and develop services, there e, there's EAs required, there's approvals, but there's also the preparation of applications in the private sector, the need to fulfill conditions, and ultimately the private sector has to decide to build the housing because municipalities cannot make anybody build housing unless they build it themselves. Next slide. So the reality is, it's more like a funnel than a pipeline. And in fact, municipalities fill the funnel at every time they do updates to their official plans, and it works its way down through the process and comes out the bottom, in the smaller hole at the bottom, as housing that meets the needs or is intended to meet the needs of the population for the forecasted amount. Next slide. And if anybody who's used a funnel before, uh, especially if you're pouring water into it, you realize once it's full, uh, it doesn't matter how much more water you pour into it, it just spills out the top. And, and the same amount continues to come out the small hole at the bottom. So next slide. What we need to do if we're going to, to meet the pent up demand that's been identified is not continue to put more land into urban areas. That's going to do nothing but, but actually hinder the process. What we need to do is open up the bottom of the funnel, not, the, not add more in the top. Next slide. Oh, actually, I think that's the last slide. Yeah, um, Ian, if you can just put me back on here. So, you know, putting it in very simple terms, I, I think that some people at least will understand the, the system, if we, if we just keep shoving land in the top, staff have more and more things to deal with. There's more and more resources that need to be spent on EAs and figuring out how to service it. And you effectively constipate the process. And, and you know, in very simple terms, if you're constipated, you don't need a big meal, you need a laxative. You need to find a way to open up that bottom part and that's what we really need to, to you know, focus on. What's become a provincial fixation with adding more and more land to urban areas is a serious distraction from the real issues we face and the real solutions needed to resolve them. And there are solutions. 
We just need to get to them. Thanks, Kevin. I don't think you've used that analogy with housing before with constipation. So <laughs> I think it's very visceral and real. So thank you for that. Sharice, do you have anything to add on to this? Yeah, um, just a couple things that Kevin pointed out um, about the lack of resources, um, including um, staff, planning staff. Like we, you know, there's this myth that if we just flood the market with more housing supply, it's going to trickle down into affordability, right? But, and, and so that's why we've got this agenda, like let's build all the housing everywhere as much as we can. We're not gonna be building all the housing everywhere as much as we can. CMHC has said as much. We don't have enough labor. Um, we don't have enough construction materials and we don't have enough staff resources. Um, so we need to be, front loading the right supply that we want to build, but instead we're front loading the wrong supply. We're front loading, you know, sprawl. And that's the housing that's going to be built. It's not going to be the quantity that we say that we need. It's going to be specific housing that has been, you know, kind of blocked by previous policy. And so the resources, you know, the, the staff, as Kevin says, we can't approve things more quickly if you actually remove um, the staff as they have been doing. And so when, when we talk about um, land and we talk about being able to have enough land to build, I, Kevin's point about, and Ian, if you could just bring up those first slides of mine. Um, Kevin's point about City of Toronto is a great one because City of Toronto has run out of they ran out of land, the city of Toronto ran out of greenfield land a whole long time ago. And yet the city continues to be able to add more housing and exceed the targets as Kevin explained. Um, I think the challenge now is building family friendly homes because we have, you know, kind of throughout our region, we have this tall and sprawl um, to simplify things. And, you know, the challenge is we need to build family friendly homes. So qualifying um, the housing that we build on the land that we have a lot of is really important. And I'm just gonna quickly run through this case study that we did um, a few years ago in Mississauga to understand what was possible if we tried to accommodate the population forecast within the already existing urban and suburban boundary in this one municipality. So not expanding any sprawl. Um, so we, you know, here you see, this is Mississauga, it looks like a stake, but we identified places for growth, transit corridors and stations, centers, arterial nodes, low density plazas. And we found that like the key to this was not only could Mississauga accommodate all of its population growth. And next slide, please. But um, we, um, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at moderate densities, so mid-rise and lower. And we wanted to make sure that we were looking at family-friendly housing. So the average, when we did our modeling, the average unit was 100, was 1,000 square feet. So if this isn't about adding small one-bedroom units to tall condos. It's about livable family friendly density. And next slide please. And we found that Mississauga not only could accommodate all of its population growth with this very qualified type of density, family friendly, large, um, lower scale density, but they could accommodate 85% of Peel region's growth doing this. So, so there's a challenge because we have this narrative that the only way we can build family-friendly housing is to build houses in greenfields. And that's just not the case. There's so many benefits that we'll talk about later. And just one final slide, um, please. Yeah, so this is uh, from a study we did in 2020 called Density Done Right. And just really trying to visualize there's you know, two different ways, um, for example, to build 300 units. And we need to get better. I think the challenge now for, for municipalities um, is we need to get better at building um, the right density. Because if we continue to build mostly one bedrooms and tall condos, then we're pushing people to sprawl. 
and search. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy um, that we've got to go to the green fields to get family-friendly homes and the white picket fences. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> No, it's great. I mean, I'm really hoping that this can be more of a conversation and less of a, okay, now this is the question, whatever. So I might take us totally off tangent here, but I really liked your point about fam fam family friendly housing and how we equate that with a single detached home. And I will tell you, coming from Simcoe County, where there's lots of sprawl, the actual house might be what we consider family friendly. It's got a backyard, every kid has their own bedroom, whatever, but access to childcare access to transit, access to jobs, schools that are open that they're not traveling 45 minutes on the bus to get to, access to family physicians. So we have narrowed that idea of what family friendly means to the point we're just looking at the bones of a structure versus what is a family friendly community. And I think that's a part, and I hadn't really thought about that until you had said that, Sharice, is that you know, this, these family friendly homes are usually located in family unfriendly communities. <laughs> I mean, we, we have in Barrie, for example, our downtown doesn't have a high school or, you know, so what, what are people supposed to do when we, when we try to intensify? Anyways, I'm getting us off on a tangent, but I think what, what I've heard from both of you is that this kind of focusing on red tape and land supply has oversimplified the problem to the point where it's actually compounded the problems of the housing crisis, right? These simple fixes have forced us into actually making the problem worse. Would you agree with that? Did I did I summarize that improperly? Kevin or Sharice, just be able to jump in. No, I, I, I think you're right on uh, with that. And I think, you know, maybe leading into uh, another topic here, um, I, I think the reality is if the province was serious about solving the housing crisis, uh, you know, they'd be establishing collaborative processes with people. You, you don't get family friendly housing or just being dictatorial and or just dealing with the development industry. If it was that easy, we would have done it years ago. You know, the, the only way that we're going to get the kind of housing that we really need as we move forward here are, are through partnerships with the, the, the various levels of government. Uh, we, we need uh, the province, the municipalities, nonprofits, cooperatives. We need charitable organizations to get involved and, and other agencies. And, and instead of bringing people together uh, to, to recognize and identify the problem and to define the problem properly, what we get is 1.5 million is needed by 2031, and we are going to eliminate every single possible rule that's out there, no matter the consequences, in order to build any type of housing anywhere faster. And it comes at such a cost. The, uh, you know, I like to tell people planning is the best fit world. It's not, you cannot, you know, build housing at the cost of, of us addressing climate change. You can't do it by eliminating our environmental areas just because it gets in the way of developers. You, you know, you can't do that. Those are our future. Those are our children's future. And agricultural lands, the latest change is proposed to, to allow things like up to three severances off of farms in prime agricultural land. Like, that's just, it's crazy. I, I mean, that has moved from, you know, even being dignified in saying that, oh, I disagree with them professionally. That's just crazy. It's absolutely over the top. And, you know, we've got to get back to solutions and solutions are going to come by people talking, people working together. Absolutely. The private sector has a role to play. No question at all. But to expect the private sector to deliver affordable housing when they've never done it in the past. And quite frankly, that's not the business they're in. It's just completely unreasonable. And to throw more land and more incentives at them on the, you know, the vain hope that this is going to, you know, be different than times gone by. It's just not a solution. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Sharice, you mentioned it a little bit early about the housing affordability. And it seems like the plan is you just put so much land and so much supply into the system 
that it devalues housing to such a degree, like the supply exceeds demand to the point where all of a sudden houses become affordable. I mean, that seems kind of where they're going. It, one, is that reality, is that, a, is that an approach that would even work? And uh, is that really what housing affordability needs? Well, uh, it's, it's so interesting because there's that assumption that we just need more supply and it will create affordability. And I think we all recognize that we need more housing supply and we need the right supply. But there is this myth that just like volumes of supply, like if we if we remove all the red tape and, and present all this land, then we're gonna get all this supply, this 1.5 million homes. And you know what, developers, they're gonna pull back if um, like according to their absorption rate, They've done this in the past. You see them. It's kind of a bit of a dance. If prices get too soft and then they pull back on their projects until the prices come back up again, because as Kevin says, you know, they're in the business to um, build market rate housing and turn a profit. It's hard to turn a profit. There's a lot of factors when you're a developer. And right now, interest rates are one of them. So there's tens of thousands of units that are um, that have been stalled that are kind of, you know, we're supposed to be built, but because the economic conditions aren't favorable, there's a pullback. And this happened before during the financial crisis as well. It's happened in other times. So to answer your question about like, you know, is it going to generate affordability? It's, it's you know, I, I think that we're, we're in a lot of trouble if we're just relying on the, the, the private sector to build affordability. And I'm not trying to put developers down, like this is their job, this is what they do. So we need to be more um, deliberate about building affordable housing. And that really harkens back to, um, you know, when we used to build not-for-profit housing, when we used to build social housing. So in the 60s and 70s, we built, like, all the affordable housing that currently exists was built pretty much in the 60s and 70s, either subsidized housing or private um, rental housing, which is affordable, or land trust, as Kevin says. And we just stopped. We stopped like in the 80s and downloaded all of the responsibility to the province. And then finally, it landed at the municipality's responsibility with no resources to build more housing, more affordable housing. And, and, and when it comes to subsidized or public housing, like the, the city of Toronto is just trying to maintain the stock they have. So we actually need to be looking at all levels of government, including the federal government, to get back in the game of building mm -hmm. um, social housing, building affordable housing, because all of the subsidies, the budget priorities all moved to ownership. It became, let's put all of our investment into ownership, tax breaks, let's put incentives, let's do all these. There's so many um, David Halchansky at U of T um, did this analysis that there's like something like seven to eight billion dollars associated with incenting ownership. And there's no nothing for rental and there's you know nothing for public housing. So um, we really need to to focus on that if we really want to solve this crisis. Private developers have their place, but when we're thinking about utilizing our public land, we should be, you know, bringing back the playbook book that we had before and figuring out how to do that with all three levels of government. Yeah, absolutely. I don't I don't think anybody's free from this conversation. Where do you what do you want to add about the sprawling to affordability, Kevin, and, and I, I how, think we, that, how we get there? Well, I think there's a couple of comments uh, just building on what Cherie said. I, you know, just building more housing doesn't necessarily solve the problem because it's not one problem. It's a series of problems and each housing sector has, has a different set of challenges and they have different solutions. And part of the problem that municipalities are facing right now is they have no idea what, they, a lot of them don't, have any idea what the need is in the various segments. The province has just thrown out this 1.5 million, but how many of those are seniors oriented housing? How many of those are family friendly apartments that we need? 
How many of those are deeply affordable housing that you know we know can only be built by the municipalities? We they, they've thrown out this number of 1.5, and and it seems to be because there's there was no basis or justification given. The only rational you know comment I've heard is exactly what you said is that this will get us near the perfect balance between supply and demand, and therefore housing prices will be great. But you know. There's no way, there is absolutely no way we can build 1.5 million homes by 2031. That would involve us doubling, virtually doubling what we have ever built in the, the best years in, in Ontario. It's not going to happen. So we need to figure out exactly what the problem is, and we need to be laser focused with our resources to delivering on the areas that are truly in crisis. It, it, we're in, and municipalities need to be in a triage process right now because there are only so many resources and that's both staff and it's building supplies and it's labor and we've got to make the best use of it we can. We cannot just start building suburban homes again because somehow we feel that going back to the past is, is a solution. It's not. And, and, and that's the one, you know, the one point I really want to make on, on this question, and I apologize if I take a few more seconds, is the, you know, the, the past is not the future. And, and anybody who thinks it is, is dreaming in technicolor. I mean, demographics have changed. Life expectancy has changed. Family size and the formation timing has changed. Multi-generational responsibilities have changed. The lengths of retirements have changed. The ethnic makeup of our communities is very different today. The, the education options open to people online, in schools have changed. You know, work at home opportunities have changed. Lifestyles have changed. The housing market has changed with what's available on the market now, and transportation has changed. We cannot, how can you ignore all of that change and say the solution is to sprawl again? You know, that's what caused the problem in the first place. And so we've got to, we've really got to figure out exactly what the problem is and get laser focused with the few resources that we actually have to solve the segments in crisis first. We really need to work on that. And, you know, I, that's ultimately where the solutions are for municipalities is figuring out in your municipality exactly what the problems are. Yeah, absolutely. Sharice, I saw you writing something. Did you want to add something or are you ready to move, to move on? Oh, I, you know, I saw somebody just put a comment about modular housing up there, which I think is super smart. We can talk about those things. Um, I think that we also need to talk about the fact that we're in a climate crisis as well. And that's totally yeah. being ignored, but we can get through more of your questions. <laughs> we'll get I, through, I, we'll get through as much as we can. <laughs> I just write stuff down. Yeah, no worries. I think that um, I really appreciate both of your comments on that, because I think we don't have to make it sound like a problem we can't solve, but we don't. We also don't benefit when we oversimplify it. And um, there is a book I was telling you about when we did kind of our pre-meeting that I read called Scarcity. And when you get into a scarcity mindset, one of the psychological uh, effects that people get into, and it could be at a societal level or an individual level, is this idea of tunneling. And you get so focused on a problem and you get so focused on the solutions that you want to implement that problem that you forget all of the other things that could be a part of the solution. So what you were saying, Kevin, about how we bring in those broader questions or what you were saying, Sharice, that when, when we get into tunneling, we go, I will fix everything else after I get this done, right? And if, we're, if we've got our ladder leaning up against the wrong side of the house, so to speak, and we're focusing on land supply and, and oversimplifying it that way, we're missing on the opportunities for collaboration. We're missing on the other things that communities need and that people need beyond just what the structure they live in, right? And can I jump in, Ian? I, I don't know if you're the, if you're ready for me here. Can you throw up slide thirteen because I think it really does play well with uh, with what Margaret was just talking about. And and so basically, 
in the region of Waterloo, and this is region of Waterloo data, we, you know, one of the things that, that people keep talking about is we've got, we, we've got a problem with seniors housing, we don't have enough of it, and we have a problem with singles. We, people seem to feel there's not enough singles. And, and yet, when you take a look at the, the existing inventory of housing and who owns it, all of a sudden, you know, there's a connection between those two that most people miss. You know, for example, in the region of Waterloo, 68% of the owners of singles in 2016 will be over 80 years of age in 2051. That's 77,000 single detached units owned by those people. 88% will be over 70 years of age. So the seniors in the region of Waterloo, you know, they own almost 90% of the singles, the seniors that will be aging to over 70 years of age will, will be doing that. So as people start talking about we need more singles, the answer can just as easily be we need more seniors housing that draws seniors into housing that, that meets their lifestyle, that better suits them through the continuum of changes that they have in a long retirement. And guess what it does? It frees up a phenomenal number of single detached units for young families and other, other things. And this plays out in so many of the segments that the solutions, you know, a solution to one is also a solution to another. But as, as Margaret was saying, quite often we fixate on, oh my gosh, we need housing for young people. Therefore, we need to build singles in the greenfield areas. But guess what? You know, the, in, in all of the singles we built in the region of Waterloo in the last 15 years is 18,500. And we're looking at a potential resale market in the next 30 of upwards of 90,000. Uh, like, you know, the solutions are there. They're not obvious. You've got you've to look at the data. You've got to define the problem. And you've got to look at it across the spectrum to see whether the answer is not an obvious answer, but it may be a better one in the end. Absolutely. I think uh, I can't believe we're almost at the end of our time with questions with me, which is sad because I think I could do this with with both of you for another hour at least. And um, I'm trying to figure out how to how to finish this off, I guess. What I just to summarize the the one question we were going to go through is about solutions. We might get into that in the queue later. You know, we've talked a lot about collaboration, about public housing, whether that be at the federal, uh, at the municipal, provincial, all those those levels of government have to start getting back into the affordable housing, um, you know, vein. We've talked about building single uh, or building family homes within apartments and condos. We've talked about how to densify and how to make family friendly communities. I think that idea is, is some of the solutions you provided. I'm sure you'll go into them uh, more. But as we're kind of shifting to the end, this is supposed to be about building hope. And I've, I have saw some comments that people are feeling, okay, like there is something we can do. We, we don't have to just accept this vision. For those that aren't quite on the hopeful train yet, could you share each uh, a couple of things that you find within this conversation within housing? You're both planners, you both are, are uber smart. What are some things that give you hope, whether that be locally or internationally, that, that the rest of us can get inspired by? Uh, I'll start with you, Cherise. Um, sure thing. I'm not a planner. I just play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm actually just a policy hack. Um, but I'm going to um, follow up with Kevin's point about seniors and aging in place. We have a huge opportunity to help seniors age in place by having um, really, really thoughtful municipal programs that help homeowners convert their single family homes into um, a triplex or adding a unit to that home. Um, I think that this is really the way forward because I'm going to ask Ian, no, it, we don't have any more time for slides, but I'm just, I'm going to put in a plug for your next webinar, which is going to have um, Karen Chapel and um, Michael Piper from U of T. And Karen when she was um, in California at Berkeley, she helped champion 
California added 20% of their new, their new housing supply was added um, or was met by adding one unit to a number of single family homes. And they're still going, they just did that in five years. We could do that and even more. And there's so much benefit to that because you don't actually have to demolish the house. You can add the units to the backyard. I know Franz added a laneway to his house and you can add units. It's also the most cost-effective. It's the lowest carbon. People can age in place. You're using existing neighborhoods, you're adding gentle density and it is, possibly one of the ways to get community support for this because it's not this huge huge massive change or disruption to the to the neighborhood and you can use modular components somebody talked about modular housing i know a lot of developers who are trying to work on modular housing for different scales of housing um, but we need the scale that they're doing in bc and we need the factory production and there's so many so many solutions to add family-friendly, low-carbon, gentle density um, to our neighborhoods in a very thoughtful way, but we've got to get out of this mindset. The only way to build homes is either to add them into our, our green fields or to build tall condos. Um, and they, those tall condos definitely have their place, but if we really want um, to densify and, and add housing that we need, we have to be front-loading. We have these, we have such scarce resources we need to front load the housing that we need because otherwise we're baking in the wrong supply and we're baking in um, climate emissions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kevin, I will give you the last minute, few minutes with me. What, what's something that gives you hope? Sharice was really great with that. What do you, what do you have for us? I, the, the first thing I would say is probably the opposite of what you're looking for in some yes. respects. I, I, the reason that that I'm actually really hopeful at the moment is more people now understand there's a problem. And for you know, for many people, a problem is not a problem until it affects them. So weirdly, the reason for hope I see is that the problem is now so bad that, that everyone seems to be finally recognizing that there is one. And the first step towards solving any problem is knowing you have one. And, and I think we've hit that standard. So now let's get on with solving. And a lot of it comes down to, as Sharice was saying, so much of it is, is relatively simple. It doesn't have to be huge. It, it you know, the uh, accessory units in the regional water news, Sharice, you may be interested in this. They were about 2% accessory units. Uh, if you go back a decade ago, they were 10% last year. So they're already halfway there and, it, and it's continuing to do that. We see that in Aurelia. We see it in other towns as well. So there's a huge part of the solution there. And that also takes the solution out of the hands necessarily of developers and starts to put it into the hands of, uh, of you know, the people in the community who are gonna benefit from it. And, you know, I, I think that's, uh, you know, the the, the concern that a lot of people have had that, you know, I don't want my neighborhood to change. I want everything to stay the same forever. All of a sudden people are realizing it's their child or it's their parent or it's them that in fact is gonna want to continue to live in their neighborhood. And, you know, it, when, when Charisse uses the term age in place, that's one aspect of it. The other is age in neighborhood. And, and making sure that you know, we deliver the type of housing that allows you know, me to stay in the neighborhood, but not necessarily in the house I'm in right now. And so you know, there's lots of things. Uh, the work that Sharice uh, uh, referred to at uh, U of T, uh, uh, they're doing some, some wonderful stuff there and it is truly groundbreaking. The other thing that makes me uh, quite hopeful actually is we're not in this alone. There are, this is happening in countries throughout the world and there are some wonderful solutions. Go to Australia. There are just some wonderful things happening in Australia that, that are worthy of consideration here. I understand Finland and other places, you know, they're, they're delivering things for their community without massive sprawl. We don't, the last, if, if I can end with one thing, there is one absolute certainty right at the moment, 
and that is we do not need more land. Like that debate is over. And for anybody to continue on that debate, I think is truly disrupting the process for us to get to the real solution. So let's stop with that. Provincial government, if you're listening, please just back off that and let's get on with solving it. Everybody recognizes there's a problem and everybody wants to solve it and more land is doing nothing but disrupting the process. Let's get on with it. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, something my father used to say to me is if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Yep. So for all the attendees here and all the network that you have, if you're advocating for not having your neighborhood change, you don't want, you know, accessory buildings, you don't want things to look different. Um, you're not being a part of the process to help your neighborhood shift so it's friendly for everyone. Then unfortunately, I'm going to do a self assessment here. I'm not a psychologist. So I just play one on TV. You're a part of the problem. Um, so we all have to take that responsibility because the climate, our, our water resources, our affordability is saying that we can no longer put this off. We have to, we have to do this. Uh, I've taken up too much time according to our schedule. I'm going to open it up to uh, my colleague, Ian, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Margaret. I'm going to dive right into some Q&A, and then we have a final poll, and then I'll be handing it off to Franz. So um, we're going to try to keep this as quick as we can, Sharice and Kevin, so I'll appreciate your brevity. Um, but the first question we have is from Nikki. And Nikki asks, and this is uh, this is pretty early on, so they said, do we have any data that has been collected directly from those parties, being uh, parties that are experiencing housing issues? In other words, do we know what people want and need? So if, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Kevin, because you're unmuted currently, and then we can go to Cherise on that. So that's the strategy not to go first is put yourself on mute. Um, there is, you know something, there is a lot of data out there that, that exists. And, and one of the, uh, the things that, that we've recognized, and even to the point of going back 15 years ago, it's important to do surveys. It's important to get out there and talk to people. It's important for them to tell you, this process is not dictatorial. We don't have all the answers. It is a process of working together with the community. And, and Ian, the one thing I can tell you is when you do go out and talk to people, what you find is the answers are not often what you thought they were before you went out there. And, and you've, got to, you've got to engage them. And you know, when, when I talk about changing lifestyles, uh, that's one of the things that really we're finding quite stunning is the number of people that are willing, not only willing, but want to live in reurbanization areas where they can survive without a car. Those numbers are huge. They weren't that big 20 years ago. They're huge now. Therese? I'll give you um, three, four quick stats. The first one is that um, Scotiabank did a report recently this year that identified 10% um, of Canadians, at least, are in core housing need, meaning they're in need of subsidized housing. And yet we only, subsidized housing only represents 3.5% of our housing mix. Another stat is that, um, the number of renters is exceeding owners by twice as much, yet we're not building rental housing. I don't have the stats handy about how much we have in the housing mix. Another stat is 12 years. That's the waiting list in the city of Toronto for um, subsidized housing. And 80%, um, that is, um, we did it back when I was, you know, with the Peminent Institute, we worked with the with RBC and we did a, a few studies that looked at people's home buying preference and found that 80% of people in the GTA home buyers would give up a large house and a large yard for something more modest, walkable, transit friendly. And that was um, replicated year after year. And I think that I, I could be wrong. I think Phil's on the call somewhere. I think environmental defense did a, a similar survey. Maybe it was ALO done the same thing. Thank you. Uh, so we're running slow, uh, we're running short on time for this, but I'm going to ask one question. I think is quite good. And this is from an anonymous attendee. 
Uh, and they asked, and this will be the last question before we go to the poll and then I'll hand it off to Franz. Uh, how can we make housing more affordable outside of social housing, which tends to be stigmatized and relatively undesirable? Uh, and I'll, Cherise, I'll, I'll ask you to answer that one first, just to be fair to Kevin. Sure thing. Um, there are lots of ways. Um, it involves um, a lot of building housing, using, utilizing our public land and working with not-for-profit developers. And there are ways that we can harness um, if the federal government needs to come to the table with national housing strategy, um, funding, CMHC financing, bring the public land to the table, but get a not-for-profit developer because you remove a lot of line items from the pro forma. And suddenly you've got, you know, and you employ things like modular housing, you do it at scale. That's how you can bring affordability to the table. But also, as I mentioned before, this missing little housing that you're going to hear a lot from during your next webinar um, is extreme, is way more cost effective than any other type of housing we have because you have the existing, you add to the existing home. Um, so there are ways we're just, we're, we're not, we got to think differently. Kevin? Yeah, and I think there's, you know, building on that, uh, you know, part of it is the product and, and certainly the accessory units uh, have the potential to really fill a niche. Most of them will stay rental uh, because the process of dividing them to sell them is, is difficult. But, you know, those are the types of strategies. I think, you know, part of the problem is the development industry uh, has too long a memory. Uh, they, they are, are building the types of things that worked for them 20 years ago and 15 years ago. And we need different products on the market. And whether it's delivered through partnerships with, with co-ops and et cetera, you know, other groups, or whether it's the private sector beginning to realize that, that the, the type of product they're selling today is not delivering for the people in Ontario. And, and I, I truly believe that to a great extent. You know, some of it is, you can't buy a starter home today. You know, even if, even if you have a suburban land available, they're, they're not building anything like that because, you know, they tell us they make 10 to 12% on the, the sale price of a house. If you've got a lot out there, you're going to build one at $400,000, you're going to build one at a million dollars. You know, to some extent, uh, we, need to, we need to get in, we need to figure out ways to deliver different forms, and it may not just simply be in the market model, well, it can't be just in the market model, that'll be part of it, but a lot of it's going to be uh, through cooperation, through partnerships, through of government, private sector, uh, various charitable organizations, et cetera. Thank you both. I think, I mean, we could keep going forever, but I'm going to actually hand it over to Franz. Uh, Franz, please take it away. Thank you very much. And just so that people know, we're going to have an after event uh, where we can continue this discussion and uh, we're going to do our best to get back to some of the uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, what a great discussion. Uh, thanks to all of the participants for your questions. Thank you, Sharice and Kevin, uh, for your great insights. Thank you, Margaret, for your excellent moderating. And thanks to Ian for making uh, Zoom work so well for us. As you know, this is the first webinar in our Building Hope series. I hope that uh, we've inspired you today to join us again. You can learn more about this series and how to sign up uh, on our website. I'm going to ask Ian to put the, uh, the link into the chat. Um, I'll be sending out details about the next webinar, which is going to happen sometime in the next four weeks. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, two more things before we go to the after event. Um, as Ian suggested, we've got a Zoom poll to help us make sure that these webinars are actually doing what we hope they're doing. So uh, Ian, maybe you could just take them uh, yep, and, uh, and answer them. Uh, this is really important feedback for us. So just spend a moment uh, uh, completing it, please. Yeah, and just as last time, this one's going a little bit faster, a little bit of easier questions, I think. Uh, filling up pretty darn quick, so we'll we'll be able to uh, get the results to everyone very quickly. Wow, holy moly, yeah, really quickly. <laughs> Much faster than the previous poll. Uh, we're just hovering around 80%. I'll give it a little bit longer. I see some folks still filling it out. 
And we'll end there. We've we've rounded out 83%, and now I can share the results. So we had 32% uh, say that this uh, webinar was use was somewhat useful. 68% of you said very. 83% uh, of you are feel are are feeling hope from the webinar, and 17 are not. So I I think there'll be need for future webinars for uh, that 17% of you. Well, thank you very much for your feedback. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, so if you like this webinar and you want us to help, uh, uh, want us to do more of them, um, you know, to be blunt, we need your help. Um, and we would really appreciate if you could make a donation now. And uh, I'm going to ask Ian to uh, put into the chat a link. Uh, this is to the website of the Small Change Fund, our charitable partner. And uh, please consider making a donation. It doesn't matter how large or small it is. Um, you know, your donations will help us continue doing things like this with webinar, uh, publishing the reports that uh, that Kevin Eby wrote on housing supply, getting in the media, um, uh, connecting with people, bringing more people on board, and most importantly, just spreading the word, spreading hope to Ontarians that there are options, there are solutions to the many problems that are facing us. So thank you so much for whatever donation you can make. Finally, uh, the recording of this webinar should be available on our website no later than early next week. So please share the link uh, when, uh, when it's available, uh, share it with others who you think need to hear about this. And don't forget to sign up to become a member of the Alliance if you haven't already done so. So finally, for those of you who have to leave, thank you so much for joining us. For those who want to stay on, please do so for our after event.